Hello and welcome to another series of Garden Club. For our first programme, we've taken to the high seas, heading for the Isles of Scilly, situated some 28 miles west southwest of Land's End. There are five inhabited islands, including St Mary's, the largest, and about 40 smaller islands, many of them famous for their bird life. Most of the island's 2,000 population are engaged in tourism and to a lesser extent fishing and of course the bulb industry for which the sandy soils are ideal. Mention the sillies to most gardeners and they immediately think of the world-renowned Tresco Abbey Gardens. But what's life like for the ordinary gardeners here? Penny Rogers and her husband Peter are bulb farmers in St Mary's and in her spare time she tends the garden started by Peter's great-grandmother. As in many other gardens in the Sillies, exotic plants thrive here, including the spectacular Madeiran Cranesbill, Geranium madarensi. Now, I've seen this plant growing in gardens all over St Mary's Penny. Yeah. Did you plant it here? Well, I did originally, and then uh, it does seed itself. So how long does it take before it flowers I mean, from a seedling? Well, they, they start off, you know, obviously really tiny, and then um, about two or three years. You can never quite tell whether they're going to flower after two years or three years. So it's quite exciting. Yeah. Tremendous head on it. And uh, yeah. you obviously noticed right. the leaf stalks. If you look yeah. at them, they're like flying buses. Great. These. Yes, they're marvellous. They, they come down and they, they have these great stands. So it, it sort of ends up like a, a double cone thing. Right. And with this gorgeous head of flower on it, which yeah. is really quite dramatic. So when, they're when supporting they're the huge yeah. head. And so you've got it's another exciting. exotic over there, Puya. That's Is that great. my favourite? That's wonderful. It's a marvellous uh, architectural plant, this, isn't it? It, it is. It's wonderful. And beautiful, but lethal with Certainly, all those the spikes spiny do leaves. keep clear. Um, yes, they're pretty, pretty well, dangerous. How old is this clump? I can't honestly remember. Probably 10 plus years. We planted it as a very small rosette, little rosette in a pot. And it just seems to have enjoyed its life here. and. Come on. Yeah. And you, I see you've got two old flower spikes. Yeah. That was flowering last year. Yes, those are the last year's ones. I shall take those out very yeah. soon. Um, and it's amazing. This year, I can't tell you, it's flowered every other <laughs> year and, until last year. And then it, it, gave, it had one flower spike, two last year. And now, this year, it's incredible. Look, there's five, six, seven, eight, I don't know. <laughs> I'm so thrilled, I can't tell you. And the colour of the flowers? Beautiful. Um, this really lovely jadey, aquamarine, turquoisey, bluey green thing, and then they've got very golden stamens and pollen, and all the birds go in and get yellow heads. And <laughs> new kind of bird. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> and I see yeah. here you've got the big rosettes, young stems of the yes. echium from the canarians, yes. pinanana, right. is it? I think so. It's um, it's an interesting one too. This, I mean, whereas this, obviously perennial and keeps, I hope, keeps growing. These set seed. They flower after two or three years right. and send up this huge spike. The rate of growth, I mean, of these and these... It's like a chimney, isn't it? <laughs> fantastic. It's growing while we look at it, I guess. Yeah. It, it's amazing. I mean, we are lucky. I don't take the geraniums in these self so and most of the time they're fine. But there was a, a terrible, terrible time in 1987 when we had the most appalling week of, of snow and ice and sub-zero temperatures and easterly wind. And that did a lot of damage. Really? And a lot of these sort of things were wiped out. It was just really? a brown, stinking, disheartening mass of really? horribleness. Yeah. Took a bit of time to yeah. get up courage yeah. to come out again. And what, what about again. the rest of the garden? What happened there? We've got one or two things I could show you in there. Really? You, right. You, like to survive the storm? Yes. And some that didn't quite. <laughs> This is our utility area, but this is what I really wanted to show you. What's this? This is a metrocidrus. Um, That's the flame tree of New Zealand. Right. What a and, size! Yeah, and it was gorgeous. But I thought it was killed. We all did, because it dropped all its leaves. It became, from an evergreen, it became a completely deciduous, naked tree. We topped it to try and encourage it to sprout, and it did actually put out a few sh straggly shoots. But suddenly it seems to have gained strength and it's now shooting quite strongly. It seems to be robust and, it, and 
I'm hoping like mad. It was a friend of the family, you know, it yeah, just I can understand can't that. go away. It was magnificent when it was so in full flower. It was red flowers. beautiful. It was a sheet. You can yeah. imagine this great tree, a sheet of red yeah. flowers, and it was, it was gorgeous. So it's what there. happens through here, then? You oh, kind of a tunnel? Yes. Ah. Now, this is the heart of the garden, uh, I guess, is it? Well, just about. I think I'd try and do everything um, reasonably lush, but it's not very formal, I'm afraid. It's, um, I think, silly doesn't lend itself to formal gardens. And this, this is fun. This is a hedicium, but these are last year's, but it's actually set seed, um, which I don't know if it's viable or not. I've tried it, but I haven't had any success yet. But they're lovely. They ought to be... I don't know, in the West Indies or something, these lovely yes. yellow with big long right. stamens coming out. I get the impression, Brian, that you, you, you grow any plant in this garden, would you? Nearly, but not quite. Allium and Oxalis. They are so invasive that they are really a bit of a, a problem. And They're in the, the two weeds are silly, aren't they? The Allium, um, the three, three cornered leek, mm. I think it is. Um, that came, I believe, as a small, they're, they're little tiny bulbs, about a hundred years ago. <laughs> And now it is everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And of course, if you've got it in the bulb fields and conflicting with the bulb foliage. Right. What about the famous Bermuda buttercup? <laughs> well, I think that only came just before the last war, I believe. Really? Um, and it's taken hold. It obviously loves it here, like, like the allium. And again, it competes with the bulb yeah. foliage. It's interesting to see how the flowers sort of, uh, they're sort of bell-shaped early in the day. Right. And then and as the sun gets yeah. warmer, they open out yeah. wide, like yes. a buttercup. Yes. A very different yeah. leaf, isn't it? Yes, like a shamrock. I don't really like it in the garden, I have to say, because it does overwhelm everything. Mm. It's a pleasant coastal walk to reach Matt Lethbridge's allotment on St Mary's. Perched on the cliff edge, his quarter-acre plot can take the full force of the winds unless it's carefully fenced for protection. Once inside, there's no mistaking Matt's influence. Everywhere are traces of his resourcefulness and his years spent at sea as a fisherman. Well, this is it, Rebecca. This is all there is to it. Oh, I can see your uh, fishing influence everywhere, Matt. These old nets that you've used are as barriers for the wind? Well, partly, but th th this one here is just for the beans themselves to grow up, you know. These, right. these here, well, there's no beans. I mean, there's beans under there, but these have been here. This is the third year for them. I leave them in. <laughs> And, and works, and, yeah, it? they grow again. We don't get a lot of frost there. I don't know how the frost would affect them, really. But the other, net, like that one there, that's just purely for shelter. That's a piece of an old troll I picked up on the beach. But as long as you've got um, any sort of netting or anything like that, old tree, it's just, it breaks the wind up. And it's it, got holes in it. Does that help? Yeah, because if you've got um, a solid fence, it don't let the wind through and you get, the wind goes over the top and blows back. And the old people used to say, a fence should be half an earth. So a half space and a half cover, like, you know, and that just breaks the wind then. What happened to these letters here then behind the, you? The two bigger ones there that you see, I've got to be careful there because there's a row of beetroot in there. And uh, I don't waste any ground anyway, but those two were a full row. That's all that's left out of the row. I plant them very early to try and get some early ones, but the rest blew away. And then there's another row I plant in between. But the, I put these bottle tops over them, which they, they protect them. That shows the difference in the wind, you know, you the, the effect of the wind. Looks like a good one. Yeah. There, oh, see, they're, they're the same shame as that one, really, the same planting as that one. What about those over there? Are they for protection too? Well, they're, they're partly protection. They're two old necks out of fishing pots, really. But I do use them for protection, but at the moment they're being used to force the rhubarb, that, those two there. And the other one, that's just ordinary bin liner. The Lathbridge family are great potato eaters, and approximately half the plot is devoted to them, planted from February onwards to ensure a continuous supply from now until next January. And Matt, you're very economic with your seed potatoes, aren't you? Yeah, well I am. With the late, so I, I just plant to the top. I, I take, you know, take the ordinary potatoes that I'm eating, and that's all you need. See, that's just the skin. When you peel a potato, you've got good ones. Just cut the tops off and plant them, and then little shoots. I've grown them like this, just the tops of potatoes for several years. And you found it works well? Yeah, yeah, I, I, 
I planted one row in amongst the normal potatoes and they were just as good, so that's all I use now really for the lates mainly. And so obviously you get much more for your money because you've eaten the potato first. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's more sense than just using the potato to rot. Now, it? of course, over here on the cities, I know you've had a bad year this year because of the weather, but yeah. normally you should be way ahead of the mainland oh, yeah, in terms of your yeah, potatoes yeah, being ready. Yeah, yeah. Those two or three seed I picked up when I was digging over the ground and I shoved them in there extra early just to see what would happen. So we'll have a look and see, see if there's anything there. Let's have a dig there. and see then. Because that should be ready now anyway. But uh, I don't know whether there's anything here, Mike. <laughs> You've had them covered up. Oh, yes, oh, there are. They're lovely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 yeah, that'd be enough for a seed, isn't it? <laughs> be your first meal of pota new potatoes then tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Keith Bennett, a boat builder, sailed his yacht from the mainland to the Isle of Briar and never left. He's created a garden right on the seashore, which is in such an exposed position that without the protection of windbreaks, few plants would survive. What was it like when you arrived here? Um, well, this was quite run down when I eventually got it. Uh, there were no trees at all in here, only on the opposite roadside there. And um, all the hedges had to be put in when we got the place, you know, before we did anything in order to uh, give ourselves some protection. Mainly because the roof kept blowing off. <laughs> Look at that cabbage palm. Yes, they uh, well, actually that was the first palm. They were the first palms which went in because they're very easy to grow. Uh, it's sort of palm that everybody goes for to start with, and we followed up later with these Canary Island date palms. Yes, isn't that's it. it. Yeah. it. Yes, very slow growing but quite tough. It will work out pretty well as a house plant too. You wouldn't be able to tell that by looking at the size of it, but no, initially it will no. grow well. Yes, because it's, it's it's due to its slow growth and the tracky carpus, of course, is very hardy. What sort of conditions does it tolerate here? Mm, it stands up to any, anything, more or less. So it doesn't like a lot of wind. It does need a shelter position like this. Otherwise, you can see the leaves get rather damaged. Is that that's surprisingly yeah. frost and cold hardy? A lot of people think that palms will only grow in the tropics in warm climates, but that really is a tough one, isn't no, it? No, it'll grow throughout the country. Um... Do you have any others? Yes, around the back of the garden. Okay. <laughs> Me through, that's lovely. That's great. It's like a jungle in here. It is, yeah. And uh, just here we've got an unusual one, which is a Washingtonia, of course. And uh, that was a seed brought in by a yachtsman coming from Mallorca. Did it germinate easily? What does happen is it tends to, once you plant it out, it tends to sit there for a couple of years, making up its mind where it is, I suppose, and then uh, away it'll go. They're all the same. They all take time in, once in the ground to uh, obviously adjust themselves. It's got this lovely fan, but these teeth here are incredible, aren't they? Yes, they're really, uh, of course, you find all palms have got rather nasty spikes at the base of the uh, leaf, but this this isn't quite as bad as some of the others. As the summer goes on, this will grow out and um, much, you know, new, much nicer leaves will come on. And it's one of my favourites. He's one of England's most respected. How's this for a spectacle? It's called Brugmansia sanguinea, better known as Datura sanguinea. It's in the same family as the potato and also the tobacco plant. It comes in the wild from the Andes of Peru, though it's commonly planted in other Andean countries, especially around farms and villages. Now, I know this is not a hardy plant for most of the British Isles, but it does make a smashing big tub plant or pot plant for the conservatory, and you can bring it outside in the summer and put it on the patio. Now these flowers in the wild in South America are pollinated by hummingbirds. But here, it's the bees that have a field day. And there's one other story too. They say in South America, because of its narcotic properties, that if you should go to sleep under one of these bushes, you might never wake up again. 
When plants are your passion, there's always something new to learn. As Barbara Clark discovered when she moved from her garden in Warwickshire to a south-facing plot on the Isle of St Martins. She's had to give up her favourite rhododendrons and conifers for exotic plants which grow like weeds. This has been quite a challenge actually because it's so different to my other garden in the Midlands uh, by Stratford and Avon, which the soil conditions were completely different. Uh, very heavy clay, very difficult to grow, light, things that like light soil, but lovely for roses and for camellias and rhododendrons and Paris forestry. I have a little one over there actually, which I'm trying to grow, which is struggling. Uh, it is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> So as you can see, the soil is not uh, in favour some for things like that. So which plants have been successful? Well, the Madeira geraniums, as you see, have taken me over. They, they're teaching me the lessons, actually. Um, it's trial and error all the time. And uh, wonderful things do grow here, like the Romnia, which I've never had before. That's lovely. Yes, and very few people can grow it. I know people on the mainland would love it. So oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> when something likes it here, it really likes it. I even noticed a big clump of sporaxis over there. Yes, it's that was so only about half a dozen bulbs to start with. And I mean, that really has spread and spread. And valerian, of course, I know valerian yeah. always likes the sea air, doesn't it? And I mean, that is everywhere. And over here, there's a super yucca. Oh yes, that's quite a tale for that, actually. Um, I was always looking for plants for this garden because there was nothing in it when we first came. We were walking along the beach and all of a sudden I saw this plant rolling backwards and forwards in the sea and I thought, gosh, I wonder if that's any good to grow in the garden. So when I picked it up, it was a yucca I could see, so I thought, well, I'll give it a chance. And I put it in and here we are, this is what it is. And, and it flowers still... every Christmas time. Oh really? Yes. To order? Yes, yes, Christmas time ever since, well, after about the second year. And I'm thrilled to bits with it, really. One of Silly's best-known gardeners is Claire Harvey. She and her late husband, Leslie, built their home above the sea at Hughtown, St Mary's, 35 years ago. And though she is now 91 years of age, she's still gardening. To reach her garden, you have to go down some steps and through a sally port in the old garrison wall. Claire, what was this site like when you first arrived? It was just a mess of elm suckers. And we had to cut that all down before we found what there was underneath. That uh, Xanthodesia there, I guess that's one of your favourite plants. Did you plant that? No, that was here. That was under the elm trees. It always amazes me that a plant that grows wild in South Africa should prove hardy in, in, in our climate. Mm. Beautiful flowers. Some people call it the Easter lily. I see quite a lot of cinerarias. Now, I grew up on the parks department and we used to grow cinerarias as pot plants in greenhouses for the home, but here you grow them outside in the winter, don't you? Yes, yeah, so they're annuals, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, they seed all over the place. I mean, we just pull them up where we don't want them. Really? How, how close to the surface is the rock here? We're on the cliffs after all, aren't we? Well, uh, where you're sitting, you could probably get down about six inches, I yeah. should think. The uh, rock comes through in quite right. a lot of places. Of course, it's very shallow soil in rocky places, suit plants like that broom over there. Now, which one's that? That's uh, Citrus monspellianus. All right. And that flowers a long time, doesn't it? Well, it starts about Christmas and it goes on till May. Right. And the nice pink flowered one at the back of you there, what, what is that? Oh, that is Citrus minstead and that'll be, that'll be about the third generation of cuttings that we've rooted. Oh, really? Yeah. Lovely yeah. habit, isn't it? So all those arching, slender yes. growth. Oh, it's lovely. Like a waterfall. Yes. Pink flowers. I, I remember one of my first visits to uh, Tresco, I was amazed to see a rare shrub called Brachyglottis from New Zealand. And I see you have one at the back there, and it's flowering. Yes. Uh, has that been there a long time? Well, no. Uh, they were practically all killed with the great freeze. And, uh, we have a flower table in the museum and I used to bring down the rubbish that we threw away and put it on my compost heap, yeah. which was great fun because you never knew what would come up in the garden. Right. And this bit was sticking up and I thought, 
I'll stick that in and see what happens. So I stuck it in, there it is. Wow, and those flowers, I, I've been told, are beautifully scented. Like well, this is the first year that it's flowered. Oh, right. It must be about six or seven years old yeah. now. Right next to you there, that beautiful Arbutus, that's Menziesii from the Pacific coast, isn't it? Yes, and it has been lovely, but last year we had three easterly gales in one week, so I was terribly afraid that it was dead. Mm -hmm. But however, it's obviously making a try now. And you still have the beautiful bark, that oh, the bark, new yes. bark. Yes, that bark peels off. And then the, the young wood, when it comes, is green. Mm -hmm. So that it's really a very beautiful yeah. tree. Did you uh, design this garden? I mean, did you actually put no. anything on paper? No, goodness no. Why ever should we? A garden to my husband was a place where you grew plants. When something came out, particularly in the rock garden, he would call me and we would go and we would gloat over one little plant, I you like see. It. Yes. And that was really what it was. I mean, people used to ask him why he didn't make paths. And he said, what's the good of a path? You can't grow anything in it. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, you're still enjoying your garden? Oh, yes, there's nothing I would... I couldn't live without it. I'm careful not to put in anything that won't flower for the next 20 years or anything like that. How about this? Where else could you get so much colour in one place? Canary Islands, Madeira, maybe South Africa? Oh, you're wrong. We're in the Tresco Abbey Gardens. You don't think we could come to the cellars, do you, without visiting Tresco? And here on this one bank, there are so many countries of the world represented, Mediterranean areas of the world. Look at these echiums, blue and purple. Look how the bees love them. These are derived from plants which grow wild in the Canary Islands. And so too those big mounded brooms up the top of the bank there, Citizus. These are hybrids which have been raised in these gardens over the years. But originally the parents came from Madeira and the Canaries. These daisy flowered bushes, Euryops, from South Africa. This is Euryops hybridus. Look at that big bold rosetted plant over there, blue green spine tipped. That's a fur croy. You know, so many of the plants that are grown in the ordinary gardens of Scilly came from here, Tresco. It's an amazing garden. There's no other garden like it in Europe. And to think, in 1987, this garden was almost totally destroyed by the Great Freeze. And then two or three years later, huge winds blew down most of the trees. Look at it now. And it's getting better every year. Hey, what do you think about it? It's just incredible. It's a first for Matthew and myself, and I'm just bowled over that you can find something so unique, so close to the mainland. You know, I've heard lots of wonderful stories about the gardens, and every one of them is true. There'll be quite a contrast next week, because we're off to West Wales. See you then. In the meantime, let's make more some time we've got left here. It's a big triumph, and all the flowers like parrot bills. Go on, love that.